Sorry for the slight delay. <clears throat> this week we're in Parshat Va'era. And essentially, <clears throat> our Pasha begins the process of the redemption <clears throat> of the Jewish people. And the bulk of our Pasha is the plagues. And in fact, <clears throat> Our parsha has seven out of ten. An easy way to remember it is that next week's parsha is parsha Bo. <clears throat> the gematria, the numerical value of Bo, is three. So this week there are, <clears throat> excuse me, we have seven. Next week are three. And what I'd like to do is to. Uh, speak about the plagues generally, and then look specifically at the first plague. So let's begin without any further ado. I be, the first reference which I have on my source sheet <clears throat> is a quote from the Haggadah, which I am sure everybody's familiar with. Rabbi Yehuda haya noten bahem simanim, that Rabbi Yehuda would give a sign to the plagues, a kind of catchy way of remembering them. And it says, Ditzach Adash Ba'achav. The Rabbi Yehuda would split up the plagues as three sets, three, three, and four. And in fact, there are, there are many ways that, maybe I shouldn't say many, but there are a number of ways that you could divide the plagues, <clears throat> you could divide them as five and five. <clears throat> and in fact, there are all kinds of connections you can make between different types of plagues. But what I want to focus on tonight <clears throat> is this division of three, three, and four. <clears throat> and in fact, if you look at the table, which I laid out to you, so you see, actually, I have at the top of each column, so you have the first plague, you have the fourth plague, you have the seventh plague. And as I said, since <clears throat> this week, there are only seven plagues. So you'll see that column one and column two each have three plagues. And the last one only has the seventh plague. And the question arises, <clears throat> excuse me, why make this division of three, three, and four? So I want to begin with something which appears, <clears throat> excuse me, on page three, where we have the commentary on the first plague, Makadam. If you look at the first commentary, which I have, <clears throat> it's the Rashbam. It's the Rashbam. <clears throat> on chapter seven, verse 26. It's not the first one, it's the second one. And the Rashbam says, where it says, Vayomer Hashem el Moshe bo el paro. So the Rashbam is actually commenting on the second plague. And then he notes the following. And here it says, Shnei, it should be Shtei Pa'amim. Shtei Pa'amim haya Moshe matre et paro. Two times Moshe would warn Pharaoh. B'shnei makot, by two plagues. Uvashlishi, and the third, lo haya matre, he would not give him a warning. V'chein kol haseder, and so it is with the whole, right, order of the plagues, bechol shalosh makot, okay, that in every set of three plagues, eno matre, he doesn't warn in the third of the series of plagues. Bedamu b'tzvardea, by, <clears throat> by the plague of blood, by the frogs, hitra, gave a warning, bekinim lo hitra, 
but by the lice he didn't. Ba'aro, ba'dever, hitra, and by aro, which I won't translate, there's a whole question, what is it exactly? Dever, the <clears throat> plague, he gave a warning, b'shin, with the boils, lo hitra. And by the same token, b'barad, uvar, hitra, by the <clears throat> hail, and by the locusts, there was a warning, b'choshech, lo hitra. But the third, there was no warning. So, <clears throat> The Rashbam is essentially giving you what we could say, a certain, there's a certain literary structure. The literary structure is that, in fact, there really are three sets of plagues. And what characterizes the three sets is that in each set, in the first two, there is a warning. In the third, there is no warning. And he goes on and he actually lists them out. And in fact, if we just look, for example, go back to the first page. So you see that, <clears throat> excuse me, this is chapter 7, 14. God says, Vayom Rashem Moshe, God said to Moshe, Kaved Lev Paro, Pharaoh's heart is heavy. May Ein Lishalach Ha'am, he, refer, he refuses to send the people. Lechel paro baboker, go to him in the morning. He's going out to the water. And you should stand firm <clears throat> towards him. And then it says in verse 16, and you should then say to him, which is, send forth, God so says, God, send, send forth my people that they should serve me. And, <clears throat> and if you. <clears throat> Although it doesn't say, <clears throat> okay, it says, <clears throat> if you don't listen, or it says you haven't listened to what I've told you up to this point, thus says God, so shall you know that I am Hashem, I am going to bring this play. In any case, you have Moshe being instructed, go to Pharaoh. If you look on the next page with the, with the, with the frogs, uh, chapter 7, verse 26, Vayom Hashem Moshe Boel Paro, he said to Moshe, come to Pharaoh, and you should say to him the following. And then if you scroll down to page 3, which is the introduction to the third plague, Vayom Hashem Moshe, God says to Moshe, say to Aaron, Stretch forth your rod and now hit the ground, which there is no Moshe going to Pharaoh. And just to save us time, you can check this out. I, the Rashbam certainly did his homework, and I would venture to say it's not only the Rashbam. There are many commentaries who agree that there is a pattern over here. And then the question arises, what is the significance of the fact that for the first two of each set, there is a warning, and for the third, there isn't. But before I answer that question, I'll come back to this idea of the warning, okay, and those. If you go to page three, right at the bottom of page three, you have Rav Samsel Raphael Hirsch. Okay, and if we look <clears throat> three lines down at the end of the line, so it says, Kfar Rabbi Yehuda Chil Kan Already Rabbi Yehuda divided the plagues into groups. The Fi Simanim Eile, according to these mnemonic signs, Ditzach Adash Ba'achav. And then he says, Chalukazo, this division, mitkabelet me'eleha, right, is kind of understood by itself, mitoch etzem te'ur hakorot, hakorot, from the midst of the description of what happens. And now look at what he says. Ki makot, in two <clears throat> plagues, Kodemet hatra'a brura. There is a clear warning. The ilu ashlishit, but when it comes to the third of the set, dahainu, which is kinim shchim choshech, ba'am below azharah. 
it comes without any warning. Heavy Omer. And therefore he says, that means to say, Hashlishit, Hina Ha'onesh, that the third plague of each series is a punishment. Al Shalo Sha'u El Shteha Rishonot. Because they didn't pay attention, they didn't re respond to the first two of each set. Which means that if, you, if I stop over here, according to Rav Shimshel Afal Hirsch, in the first two plagues of each series, so God is giving Pharaoh a chance to avoid the plague. And God is warning him in advance. By the way, I'll just point out <clears throat> that if you actually read the verses, it never says that Moshe went to Pharaoh and warned him beforehand. Now, this is an assumption which all the commentaries make that if God told him to do it, that in fact he actually went, but it doesn't record it. The only plague where it records <clears throat> Moshe going to Pharaoh and warning him in advance is actually the opening plague of next week's parsha, which is the eighth plague, the locusts. And so I'll just, <clears throat> excuse me, point out that the fact that it doesn't actually say Moshe went to Pharaoh is not an issue. I think, you know, that everybody assumes he did go. Why doesn't the Torah tell me that? Because in fact, nothing happened. When Moshe went to Pharaoh, Pharaoh did not respond to his warning. And as a result of that, so therefore, we, Moshe then proceeds and brings the plagues. It's only the eighth plague where we get a response that's in the direction of what God would have wanted. And I'm not gonna go into that right now. Maybe we'll do it next week. But I just want you to see, it's important to note that in other words, it doesn't record that Moshe actually went. So according to Rav Shimshu Lefal Hirsch, well, God gave Pharaoh the opportunity twice to avoid the plague, the third time around in each series. So he, in fact, doesn't warn him this time. And in fact, the third plague of each series, according to him, is a punishment. It's punitive. Now let's look at what he continues to say. And there's more that I have to say about this comment, but let's look at what he continues to say. He says the following. <clears throat> okay, this is five lines from the bottom. If we look, examine carefully, we will find a connection of a parallel between these three sets of plagues and between the three aspects that were at the root of the exile in Egypt and were nullified by the process of redemption. Gerut, Avdut, the Inui, strangers, slaves, and affliction. And then if we just skip a second, okay, ukimidatan shel elu, and as is the nature of these, kach midatan shel hamakot. So too is the nature or the quality of the plagues by Neenshu by which they were punished. Geirut, avdut v'inui. Okay, and then I'll just read the last part, which is, l'man yakiru, so that they should recognize, ki chasrat shacharhi, that it's totally unfounded, hit nasutam ala am ha'umlal, they're raising themselves up above this unfortunate people, and in order that they should feel on their own flesh at mar onyo, the bitterness of their suffering. 
Okay, so let me first point out, and I apologize that I didn't put this on the sheet. Okay, I, I perhaps should have done this. Look at a verse which appears in Bray Sheet in chapter 15, in a section in Genesis 15, in the section which is generally known as the covenant between the parts. And in this section, there's a certain point where God puts Abraham into this deep sleep. We could say he was anesthetized. And God then tells him that before the Jewish people will take possession of the land, there will be great, <clears throat> excuse me. He says to them, this is chapter 15, verse 13. Abraham experiences darkness, dread, falls into a deep sleep. And in verse 13, God says to him, you should know, your children will be strangers in a land which is not theirs. And they will enslave them and they will afflict them. 400 years. And also the nation that they will serve Dan Anochi, I will judge. And after that, they will go out with great wealth, which means in this covenant, in chapter 15 in Genesis, right, verse 13, 14, God, in effect, is telling Abraham in advance, the Jewish people will be strangers in a land, enslaved, afflicted. So Rav Samson Rafael Hirsch says that, in fact, there were three stages to the galut of the Jewish people. Geirut, which is being strangers, avdut, being slaves, and then the last one, which is inoi, which is being persecuted. By the way, in that section, I read it just a moment ago, it says, then also that nation I will judge. And what Rav Hirsch says is, God judges them, what we would call measure for measure, for what they did to the Jews. So that they also experience three levels of punishment. Being strangers, being enslaved, and the third being afflicted. And so what Rav Hirsch, I, oh, and let me just say one last thing, which I read. And the reason for that is so that they should, the last line, they should themselves experience what they did to the Jewish people. Okay, now, according to him, he actually goes on to say this, the first, <clears throat> excuse me, the first of each plague of each series is having them experience what it means to be a gare. The second is what it means to be enslaved. And the third is what it means to be suffering. Okay? We're not going to go through how this works out, but what I want to do is to just, <clears throat> excuse me, first of all, point out the first part of the galut of the Jewish people is when the Jewish people were treated as strangers. Now, one could say that that might have been expressed from the moment the family came down to Egypt because the family are put in a separate district called the land of Goshen. One might say, well, maybe that's not actually, you know, making them feel second rate because in a certain sense, the land of Goshen was a very, very lush area. And it seems to be that the family actually did very well living in that area. And certainly during the time that Joseph was alive, they were taken care of. So one might say that actually the process of the Galut really begins in the beginning of the book of Shemot, when Pharaoh, this is chapter 1, verse 9, where Pharaoh speaks to his people and then says, Behold, the people of Israel, 
are very numerous and very powerful, which means that the first step was when Pharaoh is now looking at the Jews as the other, and as a result, that they need to be somehow dealt with. And that might be also reflected when Pharaoh initially, right, <clears throat> has them build these warehouses, these cities, taxation. One might say that maybe there was special taxation that was imposed on the Jews, which wasn't imposed on anyone else as a way of somehow highlighting you're the other, but that's the gay root. You are strangers. You are not native. You are not part of us. But then that slowly or maybe even rapidly escalates to where the Jewish people are then given <clears throat> all types of labor to do where they're enslaved by anybody who needs a job, which is the next stage. And then what it says is, and they embitter their lives, which might be the third stage. And certainly when you get to the end of the process where Jewish babies are through being thrown into the river and being killed, that is certainly what we would call the persecution. So that what Rav Shimshul of Hirsch is noting is that there was this process of enslaving the Jews, going from initially being just foreigners, outsiders, to then being enslaved, to then being persecuted. And corresponding to that, they are experiencing plagues, which give them a sense of being strangers, then enslaved, and then, and then persecuted, being afflicted. Now, you could work this out for a moment, but what I want to point out is another thing which comes up from Rav Shimshel Fahle Hirsch, and that is, he speaks about the third plague of each set being a punishment. So what does that say about the first two plagues of each set? And according to his way of understanding, and by the way, I see, I would argue that you could say that even without him, the first two plagues of each set essentially have an educational purpose. And the educational purpose, according to what he's saying, is that the Egyptians should somehow understand, experience what they did to the Jews, how horrific it was. And perhaps if they understand that, and I might even argue that even before the plague comes, to in a certain sense, be able to step back and maybe because of the nature of the plague, to make certain associations where perhaps they would send the Jewish people recognizing the evil that they had perpetrated and not suffer the plague. But when they don't recognize it, then in the third plague of each series, they're then punished. So I just want to now illustrate this with the first set. The first set is the plague of blood. And we'll be speaking about maybe other dimensions to this, but I want to focus now on this one dimension. If we look at the plague of blood, there are actually two parts to it. Look, go back to page one. Chapter 7, verses 17 and 18. Thus says God, in this you will know that I am God. Behold, I'm about to strike with a staff on the water which is in the Nile, and it will turn to blood. And this is 18, and the fish that are in the Nile, tamut, they will die. Uva'ash hayor, and the Nile will become putrid. Vinil umitzrayim, and Egypt will weary of themselves, lishtot mayim in hayor, from drinking water from the Nile. 
And then we're told how Moshe and Aaron actually bring the plague. And in fact, how every body of water turns to blood. We're also told about the fact of, in verse 21, how the fish die, it's putrid. The Egyptians can't drink water from the Nile. Okay? Now, a big part of this plague is not just the fact that the water turns to blood, but the fact that the fish die and it smells, it's putrid. And if I follow in the footsteps of Rav Shimshel of Hirsch, I could say that the, there's a symbolism over here. And the symbolism is what the Egyptians to the Jews did to the Jews. The Egyptians threw Jewish babies into the Nile. That's how they killed them. I would venture to say that when those babies drowned and those bodies, the Nile was filled with the bodies of dead babies, that it did create some sort of putrid, putrid smell, which means that when the water turns to blood and the fish die, to what extent do the Egyptian people see those fish as somehow reflecting the Jewish people. They see the blood symbolizing the death of those babies. In effect, they are confronting before their eyes what they did to the Jewish people. Are they prepared to now look at that? You had this Nile, which is a source of life. It gives you water. It's the basis of everything that you have. You have turned the Nile into a mass graveyard. You did it. God is simply reflecting the back to the Egyptians. But they're not prepared to confront what they did and to then somehow do the corrective of letting the Jewish people out. So then we have a second plague. And the second plague is the frogs. And if you look on page two, and I just want to focus how, first of all, the frogs, excuse me, <clears throat> are now coming from all over, invading their private space. But there's one phrase, which I want to look at chapter seven on the top of page two, verse 28. The expression which you have is the sharats hayor tzfardim. The Nile will swarm, will teem with frogs. The alu uva'u bevetachan. They will go up and go into your house. Now that language of frogs teeming, swarming. Well, if you look at the beginning of Shmot. Chapter one, we're told in chapter one, <laughs> excuse me, verse seven, and the Jewish people, paru vayishritzu, they were fruitful and they teemed. If you look subsequently, okay, in verse 10, Pharaoh says to his people, <clears throat> Let us deal wisely with this people, lest they increase. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and, and fight us, the Allah, and go up from the land. So I'm just showing you how these two words, visharats, the Allah, appeared earlier by the Jewish people. And once, and not only that, but if you look all together with Pharaoh's concern. There are just too many Jews. They'll keep on increasing. We don't have any room. They're just, in a certain sense, suffocating us. And therefore, so does Pharaoh acknowledge that this is the way he looked at the Jews? Does he acknowledge the fact that he seems to be overwhelmed by these, quote, unquote, timid creatures? And as we know, he doesn't. 
he actually begins to negotiate with Moshe in the second plague. I don't think I'm going to necessarily get to there, but maybe if I do, so I'll comment there. But the bottom line is he doesn't let the Jewish people out. So therefore, what I want you to see is in the first two plagues, there is this educational component. And the nature of the plague is for Pharaoh to look at what's happening now and to see before his eyes what he himself has done. He himself has bloody denial. He himself has been paranoid, okay, of the, <clears throat> has been paranoid of the threat of the Jewish people multiplying, overrunning his country. And as a result of that, perpetrated all these evils to the Jewish people. Now is your opportunity, even before the plague happened, do the corrective, let them go. And when it doesn't happen, so in the words of Rav Hirsch, then Pharaoh is now being punished. Punished because he did not learn the lesson. And then experiencing himself, okay, the affliction of the Jewish people. By the way, I'll just comment that, in other words, <clears throat> lice, okay, unfortunately is, you know, a common thing when there are certain lack of sanitary conditions. It was certain very, very common during the Holocaust, okay? And you could say that certainly when the Jewish people were being enslaved, they weren't given optimal hygienic conditions so that it's certainly conceivable that they suffered from that. I wouldn't say that it killed them, but it certainly was very, very annoying, debilitating. So in the words of Rav Hirsch, so Pharaoh is now experienced experiencing what the Jews experienced. But I'd like to point out another aspect to this, what I call educational dimension. And I think this is very, very striking. Up till now, I was focusing on what Pharaoh, <clears throat> excuse me, perpetrated against the Jews and for him to somehow make the corrective, the compensation, the reparations to some by acknowledging what he did to now send them out. But now let's look at another aspect to the, what I call the educational dimension of the plagues. And this I highlighted in the first plague of each series. And I've read actually the first one a number of times, but now I'd like to examine it further. So let's look at the first plague, the plague of blood. And this is chapter seven, verse 17. When God says to Moshe, go to Pharaoh, what is Moshe supposed to say to him? Ko amar Hashem, thus says the Lord, da, with this you will know, Kiani Hashem, that I am Hashem. So already you see that what God is saying to Pharaoh is, there's an educational component over here. I want you to know something. Okay, it's not just I'm punishing you, but I want you to realize, to acknowledge. And in the first plague, what should he acknowledge? Ani Hashem, I am Hashem. Now let's look. <clears throat> at the fourth plague, right? The first of the second series. This is chapter 8, verse 18. And we'll start actually with the end of the verse, where it says, Leman teda, that you should know, ki ani Hashem bekerev haaretz, that I am Hashem in the midst of the land. And now I'm going to come back to this. And now let's look at the first in the last series. This is chapter 9, verse 14, Barad, the third column. In verse 14, it says, This time I'm sending all of my plagues to your heart, to your servants, to your people. Ba'avur teidah. 
so that you should know. He ain't kamoni b'chol ha'aretz. There is none like me in all of the land. So that you could see a progression over here. In the first series, God wants him to know, I am Hashem. In the second series, not just I am Hashem, but I am Hashem in the midst of the land. And in the last series, Ein kamoni, there is none like me. Bechol ha'aretz, in all the land. So now let's look at the significance of this. And once again, I apologize that I didn't put this on the sheet, but it's very easy to locate. And if you don't have a Tanakh, you'll just follow. This is chapter five in Shemot. Chapter five, which is the first time that Moshe comes before Pharaoh with the, I would say, demand to let the Jewish people go. So let's look at this for one moment. Chapter 5, verse 1. It says, And afterwards Moshe and Aaron came, Vayomru el Paron, they say to Pharaoh, Ko amar Hashem, thus says Hashem, Elohei Yisrael, the God of Israel, Shalach etami, bamidbar, send out my people and let them celebrate to me in the desert. And verse 2, Pharaoh's response, Vayomer paro, Pharaoh says, Mi Hashem, who is Hashem? Asher eshma bekolo, to whom I should listen. Lo yadati et Hashem, I don't know this Hashem. Vegamet Yisrael lo ashaleach, and also the Jewish people I will not send out. When Moshe comes to Pharaoh, he says, thus says Hashem, the God of Israel. And Pharaoh's response is, who is Hashem? I don't know Hashem. So as I've taught for many years at Pardes, the whole purpose of the plagues is what we call getting to know you, getting to know all about you. And therefore, what you have over here is you claim you don't know Hashem, I will now stick it in your face so that you will know who I am. And by the way, if you look actually at the opening verses of our parsha, which I've done in other podcasts, I think I, think I may have done it with one live with Rob Mayer. The opening section of our parsha is where Moses goes and speaks to the Jewish people about the redemption which is about to happen. And the opening verse is, and God said to Moshe, Ani Hashem, I am Hashem. And if you look throughout that opening section in our parsha, the phrase Ani Hashem comes up again and again. And this actually becomes critical because that is the name of the redemption. And I've also spoken about this in other podcasts that I've given, but I'll just reiterate it now. There are two aspects of this four letter name of God, which are important for us. The first is that this name of God is associated with a God of Rachamim, of compassion, as, as opposed to the name Elohim, which is associated with justice. The second aspect, according to rabbinic understanding, is that the name Elohim is the name of a hidden God, of a God who's somehow reflected in nature or maybe hidden in nature. Versus Hashem, which is the idea of a supernatural God. And the reason why this becomes so significant, and I'll say this now, because this is at odds with many commentaries, certainly academic commentaries, 
The whole redemption process of the Jewish people is meant to be something which is extraordinary, which is supernatural, which in no way could be understood as a natural phenomenon. And that what happens in the plagues then continues with the Red Sea, continues with the experience of the Jews in the desert, with the manna, with the well which accompanies them, at the revelation at Sinai, in terms of the presence of God which is manifest in the tabernacle. The whole experience of the Jewish people from now on, for the whole duration of time that they are in the desert, is of a supernatural God. And this runs counter to what many academics or commentaries who are more rationally, quote unquote, inclined, who try to come up with all kinds of natural explanations for the plagues and how it fits into all kinds of phenomena which we're aware of. And the whole point by using this name is, this is not something which you can explain. It's something which is totally out of the ordinary. This Hashem, who is the God of the Hebrews, is not like anything else that you worship, that you experience in nature. It's totally beyond nature. It's this Hashem, which is in effect the heart, the core, of our monotheistic belief. And so that on a certain level, when Pharaoh says, I don't know Hashem. So the education which Pharaoh is getting is, you will know me because you will now see all kinds of things which you have absolutely no explanation for, which doesn't fit into anything which is part of your rational system. And what seems to happen time and again is Pharaoh is not prepared to acknowledge the uniqueness of God. Let me just go another step. So in the first series of plagues, the idea is just to see there is this God, Hashem, who is somehow different from anything else that experiences. You're experiencing something which is totally extraordinary. A God who's beyond, I would even say the following, a God who is capable of creating a whole other order, a whole other type of natural reality. If we go to the fourth plague, the second series, so it's not just I am Hashem, but I am Hashem in the midst of the land. And what does that mean? Well, if you look at chapter 8, verse 18, where it says it, now let's look at the beginning of the verse, where God says, et eretz goshen. And I will set aside, set apart on that day, the land of Goshen, Asher Ami Omer Aleha, where my people are standing, that there will not be any Arov there. And then in verse 19, the Samti Fedut, once again, I will create a separation, although the word is actually also could be understood as a kind of Redemption between my people and your people, which means the idea which characterizes the second set of plagues is it's not just that something extraordinary has happened, but it's the idea that here is this God who is actively intervening on the land, who is creating a very clear separation between what happens to the Jews. And what happens to the Egyptians? And if you look carefully, you'll see how it emphasizes it in that second set. Whatever happened 
happened only to the Egyptians. It did not happen to the Jews in a very stark manner. So that it's not just God is capable of doing these extraordinary things, but that God actually is intervening directly in what happens and is able to make that clear separation between what affects the Jews, what affects the Egyptians, which, by the way, may also be showing how God is actually, quote-unquote, the God of the Hebrews. By the way, I'll just point out parenthetically, we're not going to be looking at this, but the Ibn Ezra, in commenting, (coughs) excuse me, on the first series, actually suggests that it might very well be that the Jewish people actually suffered the first three plagues. That they also, right, did not have water to necessarily drink from, and were only able to get water after they started digging wells. And that the frogs may also have, why? Because it doesn't say that God made a distinction between the Jews and everybody else until the fourth plague. And the obvious question is, you know, but why should the Jewish people be suffering? Haven't they suffered enough already at the hands of the Egyptians that they need to suffer as well? Excellent question. But I just want to point out that the Ibn Ezra posits that because we only find that with the fourth plague on, there is this clear separation which is made. By the way, I'll just point out in defense of the Ibn Ezra, that the Ibn Ezra might say that maybe for the first series of plagues, it was important for the Jews to also learn this educational message. Because maybe the Jewish people also didn't realize enough what was happening over here. Maybe they too did not necessarily have that belief in God. And they also had to somehow come to that awareness. But okay, I don't want to get sidetracked by that. In the last set of plagues, God says, I want you to know there is none like me. So maybe I'll just comment right now What makes, and this, by the way, is, in my opinion, one of the reasons why we end with the seventh plague, because the seventh plague, I mean, we end the Parsha with the seventh plague, because the seventh plague is unique. It's special. I will also add, and this is another podcast we once had, that for the first five plagues, if you check it closely, Pharaoh actually had free will. It's only in the sixth plague where it says, and God hardened his heart. It doesn't say that explicitly in the first five. And if you look, by the way, at the end of the seventh plague, it also says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. It doesn't say God did it, which means the seventh is the last plague where Pharaoh still has what we would call free will. What makes the seventh plague so unique? So let's look at chapter 9, verse 18, the third column on the first page, where God says, in verse 18, I will cause it to rain tomorrow. Barad, kabed mode, heavy hail. Asher lo haya kamo There was nothing like it in Egypt from the day it was founded. So you could say, well, what makes this so unique? This is completely extraordinary. There was never hail in Egypt, right? And anybody who knows anything about Egypt, There is certainly, it's a desert climate. There's a lack of rain. Egypt gets its water from the Nile. So that the idea of having hail, 
And certainly heavy hail is completely extraordinary. There's another aspect. The other aspect is what we find when the hail comes down. If we look, uh, let me just find it. This is on the, on the next page, right? Page number four. Uh, wait a second. No, no, I'm sorry. This is on page number three. And the hail, this is chapter nine. <clears throat> Verse 23. Okay, where it says, And Moshe stretched forth his rod, and God brought sounds and hail, and there was fire. And then if we look in verse 24, by Hivarad, there was hail, the Esh Mitla Kachat Betocha Barad. And there was fire that was inflamed in the midst of the hail. And Rashi on that verse points out <clears throat> that this, in fact, was a miracle within a miracle. Because how could you have fire in the midst of a hail? Okay, because theoretically, each one should neutralize the other. And yet, Rashi brings the comment that to do the will of God, this, by the way, this Rashi is on my last page. He says, <clears throat> if you look on the last page, number three, Rashi says in verse 24, nes betoch nes, this is a miracle within a miracle. Ha'esh v'abarad ma'oravim, the hail and the fire were mixed together. And the hail is water. But to do the will of their creator, they make peace among them, between them. So, so what makes this plague so unique? You have a miracle within a miracle. But in fact, what makes the plague so unique, if we go back, excuse me, to page number two. What makes it unique is that this is the only one of the plagues where Pharaoh has a third option. And what do I mean by that? In each plague, Pharaoh can either let the Jewish people go, or if he doesn't, suffer the plague. In the seventh plague, Pharaoh has a third option. He can not let the Jewish people go and not suffer the ultimate consequences of the, prayer, of the plague. And that's articulated in verse 19. Chapter 9, verse 19, the third column on page 1, where God says to him, after he, he tells Moses to tell Pharaoh about the hell which is coming. He says in verse 19, Vata, and now, shlach, send out, ha'ez, gather. I'm translating, this is how many commentaries understand the word ha'ez. Gather at miknecha ve'et kol asher lecha basadeh. Gather your flocks and all that you have in the fields. Call Adam whatever people, whatever animals are found in the field, are not gathered into the house. The hail will come upon them and they will die. And then it says in verse 20 and 21, those who feared the word of God. Me'avdei paro, from Pharaoh's servants. Heinis et avadavet mikneu al-batim. So that person gathered his slaves and his cattle into the house. Ba'asher lo samli bo'al dvar Hashem. But the one who didn't pay attention to the word of God. Va'yazov et avadavet mikneu basadet. He left his servants and his cattle in the field. So now, what happens in this plague? When the hail comes, the hail destroys the produce. But not only does it destroy the produce, 
it destroys whatever animals are left that are in the field. And not only will it destroy whatever animals are there, but it's the first time that we're told explicitly that people will actually die. And what God is now saying to Pharaoh is, I'm giving you the option now. Even if you don't let the Jewish people go out, send a directive to all of your people to gather in everything that's in the field. What God is in effect saying to Pharaoh, take me seriously. Acknowledge that here I am, I'm about to do something. And Avoid your own destruction. But I want to take it even one step further. What God is saying to Pharaoh, show some element of compassion for your own people so that your own people should not be destroyed. Tell them to go in. You don't have to let the Jewish people go out but just save your people by recognizing who I am. And Pharaoh doesn't do it. Yes, there are individual Egyptians who take the word of God seriously, who then bring their cattle and their servants into the house. But it is not because Pharaoh has issued a directive. What does God want to show Pharaoh with the seventh plague? There is none like me. What God is in effect showing Pharaoh is, you know what? You persecuted the Jews. You enslaved the Jews. Right? You saw them as being the other. But show that you have at least concern, care, for your own people, because ostensibly that's why you did it, because you saw the Jew as the other who is threatening your own people. What God is showing Pharaoh is that even though you are in a certain sense my enemy, your people are my enemy, but I'm prepared to exercise compassion towards you and your people. Because ultimately, I don't want to see you destroyed. Show me that you care about your people as much as I care about them. And this is what makes God unique. Because it's not just that God is this supernatural, all-powerful entity. But ultimately, God is not interested in the taking of life even if it's the life of, quote unquote, God's enemies. God ultimately would like to see people live. God ultimately is not happy about destruction. What God says to Pharaoh's, show me that you ultimately have some element of compassion, at least to your own people, that ultimately you care And in fact, what emerges is that the only thing which Pharaoh cares about is his rule, is his power. And that's the difference between God and Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a tyrant, tyrannical not only towards the Jews, towards his own people. God ultimately is not only compassionate to his people, but even to the Egyptians. And what you see from what happens here is that that educational message is somehow lost. So that ultimately, at each stage, it's Pharaoh, and I would even say on a certain level, with the collaboration, with the complicity, of his own people who bring about their own destruction. So what I wanted to demonstrate tonight is there is a logic behind the order of the plagues. 
if all that God wanted to do was to just punish the Egyptians for what happened, God could have very easily destroyed Egypt, brought about the plague of the firstborn, and brought about darkness immediately. And in that context, had the Jewish people, could have the Jewish people leave Egypt? But God ultimately was not interested in taking revenge in destruction. God ultimately was interested in bringing an awareness to Pharaoh and to the whole Egyptian people with the hope that despite everything which they perpetrated against the Jews, that new awareness could somehow be a redemptive act for them that could be a corrective to what happened to the Jewish people and ultimately redeem them from destruction. But when Pharaoh and his people do not come to that awareness, do not take responsibility for what they've done, when it becomes a power play, then in the end, it's as if they've set the terms which ultimately bring about their destruction. Thank you, everybody. If there are any questions, comments, feel free to uh, respond. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it is true. In other words, uh, the, the comment about how <clears throat> that you shouldn't be singing songs at the destruction of your enemies? Yes. Okay, everyone. I'll say good Shabbat Shalom to everyone. And maybe next week we'll look at the eighth plague and we'll uh, perhaps finish up what I began this week. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Rabbi. You're very welcome. Shalom.